I've told you before, but this guy, we are so blessed to have Andrew on our staff. Actually, Andrew and Luna. Uh, Luna is an amazing worshiper. And, uh, but Andrew's on our executive team and uh, the youngest on the team and just uh, amazing. I think the youngest and the wisest. It's like, <laughs> but he brings such wisdom into situations. And so uh, we're just blessed to have him with us on, on staff as part of the family. And you are blessed this morning uh, to get an amazing word from Pastor Andrew. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to get to share with you all this morning. We're going to be jumping back in to the topic that we've been on for several weeks. Uh, If you zoom out from it, we're talking about how to move from community to family. Uh, That's really where we believe as a leadership team that God is calling us. He's calling us to family. We believe that the next revival, the next move of his spirit is going to take place in family, both in, uh, in like the natural family, but in this, the family of God. And, and as we look at ourselves, not just as individual churches, but as the family and the body of God. And so that's something that we just feel very prepared on. And so it took uh, the Israelites 40 years to move from the wilderness into the promised land. And so I'm hoping that as we move from community to family, uh, it doesn't take us quite that long, but we'll see. Um, this morning specifically, I want to zoom in on the topic of righteousness Pastor Mike had started speaking uh, about righteousness uh, several weeks ago, and then since then, Pastor Marcus, and then Pastor Mike again. And and just to help you recap, because it's been a few weeks, last week we had Heidi Baker, which was such a special time. If you uh, were only at one of those services, uh, I'd encourage you to check the other one out online. We put both of them online because it felt like just one big continuation. Stories that she started at the 9 o'clock, she finished at the 11. And so if you came in at the 11 and only heard a conclusion, like go back and here at the nine o'clock, um, but it was really good. But before that, we had been talking about righteousness, and that's where I want to kind of pick up this morning. Pastor Mike had begun by talking about the two different forms of righteousness. There is our positional righteousness, which is God looking at us and saying, what I did with my son Jesus has paid for all the sin. You are now righteous. And then there is our righteous living, which is the decisions we make every day and the behaviors that we have and the actions that we do. All of that plays into righteousness. And so we talked about the understandings of that and how the, they're different, but they work together. And from there, we, we talked about how righteousness is through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's through what Christ did and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we partner in with that and we come into agreement with that and we are empowered by that. And then Pastor Marcus took us on a deep dive through Philippians 3. Um, we looked at how Paul um, was righteous in the natural. He Um, He went through his pedigree in Philippians 3 and said, I'm this and I'm this and I'm that. And if there was anyone else who could boast, I could boast all the more. And he was confident in in his behavior and his actions. But he said, all of that is nothing compared to what God has done. And so I put my, my faith in the righteousness that Christ has done for me. And then he goes on and he says, but not that I've attained it, not that I've become perfect, not that I'm nailing it all the time. And he goes on to talk about how he's still striving towards those things, that he's still working on his behavior. And, and, and from there in Philippians 3, he gives an encouragement to the church. And then the week after that, we talked about living righteously and pressing on, and we spent some time focusing on, on idolatry. And most of the time, our minds go to like little statues or golden or wooden idols, um, but really, it's, it's anything that takes the place of God. Sometimes our own comfort, sometimes our own convenience becomes a God that we begin to worship with our time and with our attention. And so Pastor Mike's message really talked about whatever we do, let's do it for the glory of God. Let's not make our success an idol or our family an idol or even these good things. Let's not make them an idol, but instead let's use everything that we do, whether we eat or we drink or whatever we're doing, let's do it all for the glory of God. Which brings us to this week, and I'm excited to, to kind of circle back and hit on uh, a lot of that with just a broad brush, but give us uh, a few tools and perhaps a different way of, of imagining the conflict or the, um, the opposition between being positionally righteous and, and behaving a certain way. To where God says that I'm righteous, and that's the thing that's been declared over my life, and that's my identity, but I still feel like I make mistakes. And so how do we reconcile that imbalance? How do we reconcile that in-between? That's what I want to look at this morning. Excuse me. But to set the stage, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, Paul's writing to the church, and he says this in verse 23 and 24. He says, For everyone has sinned 
we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. And so here's a a great illustration of this imbalance. We see that we all fall short, and yet we are righteous. And that's a difficult thing. What I'm finding in the Christian life, there are conflicting realities. There's the reality that says we all fall short, and there's the reality that says we are righteous. The reality that says I'm broke, but the reality that says God is my provider, and he's provided more than enough. The reality that says I'm sick, but the reality that says God is my healer, and he's paid for my healing. And so living the Christian life is living a life of tension between these two realities. The reality of the natural world that we live, sleep, and breathe in, and the reality of the kingdom world which we are citizens of, the kingdom of heaven. And so there's this conflicting reality, but what I'm finding and what the Lord's been pointing out in my life is that although I live in a conflicted reality, I don't have to have uh, conflicted thoughts. And let me unpack that a little bit. Um, The Lord declares that we are righteous, but sometimes I see my behaviors and my shortcomings and my slip-ups and I wonder, am I really righteous? Like, I don't feel like it today. And my thoughts begin to work against or in contrast to the word of God to not just the word as it's written, but it says that he declares. So his declarative word, the same sort of declarative word that created the heavens and the earth and the light and the plants and the animals, the same declarative word that had the power to create worlds, he's declaring that over my life, over Andrew's life, and I'm, and I'm having my own thoughts that are in contrast to that, saying, I don't, I don't know if I feel it, you know, I made this mistake, I must not be righteous, Uh, I slipped up into this, or I fell into this pattern, or whatever it may be. Insert your thing there, and our thoughts become contrary to God's thoughts. And what I'm realizing is I don't have the time, the energy, or uh, the affordability. I cannot afford to be thinking thoughts about myself that are contrary to what God thinks about me. I can't think things about me that are the opposite of what he's declaring about me. And so I need to come into alignment. Even though my reality may be conflicting, I may feel sick or I may feel broke, but the reality of God says something different. My realities may be conflicting, but I am hurting myself if I allow my thoughts to be conflicting against what God thinks about me. So, so as, as we go through this, Romans 3.23, we've all fall short, we are righteous. I want to give you some ways to think about these conflicting realities and how we can retrain our thoughts to, to come into alignment with what God says. Um, one other verse before we jump into that, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. In the New Living Translation, it says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Uh, the ESV says it uh, a little bit differently. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I love that phrasing, become the righteousness of God. The very righteousness and holiness that Jesus walked in, we have become that because of what Jesus did. As Pastor Mike had said, we become righteous through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And and that is the gospel story summed up in a sentence like, praise God that he became the sin for us so that we could become his righteousness. But what's beautiful about that is when he takes on our sin so that we can become righteousness, it rescues us from these islands of shame. Because there's times when we make a mistake or we do something we know we shouldn't have or we don't do the thing that we knew we should have and we begin to feel shame or condemnation or guilt. And sometimes that's beautiful. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit and he's calling us higher. But a lot of times it's just the lie of the enemy that says, see, I told you you weren't righteous. See, I knew you couldn't be righteous. And, and what the, the scripture promises us, what Jesus has done, what the Holy Spirit is reminding us, is that he has rescued us from this island of shame. That we don't have to isolate because of our guilt. We don't have to cut ourselves off from our church family or from our life group guys or ladies. We don't have to isolate and withdraw because we feel so messy and guilty and shameful until we you know, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and figure it out for ourselves, and then we can, like, surround ourselves with the people that love us. Instead, Jesus says, no, 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 I've already rescued you from that. You no longer have to sit on that deserted island by yourself in your shame. I've taken that away, and now you can live in community where I've called you to live, surrounded by the people that love you because they are seeing you the way that I see you, and they are affirming that I've called you righteous. And so that's what God's calling us to. He's not calling us to these islands of shame. He's not saying, man, I knew they were going to blow it. 
get out of here. He's calling us closer evermore. Just like natural parents would do when your children make a mistake, you bring them in, you pull them close, and you say, hey, that's not who you are. And you call them higher, and you say, you are a daughter of God. You are a good listener. You are, and you reaffirm these positive things that you see inside of them, and you reaffirm, you are creative. You drew on the wall. Thank God for your creativity. <laughs> Next time, let's do it on the papers. But I know that God created you, and you call out the greatness inside of them. And that's what God does with each of us. So we don't, we don't isolate. We don't run away. God's not kicking us out. He's saying, no, 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 I've called you to be righteous. I declare you as righteous, and I'm pulling you in closer, saying you don't have to live on that island of shame because you have become the righteousness of God. So that right standing with God is, is the thing that brings us even closer to him. Okay, so now for some fun slides. Uh, how many of you guys have seen any of the Marvel movies? Avengers, Iron Man, yeah, cool. Judging by ticket sales, a lot of us have seen them. They have done incredibly well, and so they're going to just keep making those until we run out of money. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to look at a couple superheroes this morning that will help us kind of think differently about this idea of righteousness and the competing thought of, like, how I behave. So first, let's put up there, um, these are going to be superheroes with secret identities. Superheroes with secret identities. So they've got an alias, but they also have like a super persona. As we'll think of it, they've got a super identity and a natural identity. So our first example is Peter Parker. Peter Parker is obviously the natural identity of Spider-Man. So Spider-Man is the one with all the powers. He's slinging webs. He's swinging from rooftops. He's fighting bad guys. He's got like spidey senses and superpowers. He's awesome. Peter Parker is like a normal like teenager. You know, he's got, like, girl trouble, he takes the bus to school, he wears a hoodie and jeans, like, nothing super special. That's Peter Parker. Super identity and natural identity. I believe God has given us a super identity, and there are times when we're just walking in our natural identity. He has declared us as righteous, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, given us the grace to live righteously, but yet we choose to put on a hoodie and take the bus when we could be like swinging from rooftops. And it's just because we thought like, oh, you know what? We believe some lie that said, oh, I knew you weren't righteous. Or we looked at our behavior and said, that must be my identity because that's what I did. Instead of saying, this is my identity, so I must not be doing this anymore. Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Uh, another example for the ladies in the room, Diana Prince and Wonder Woman. Any Wonder Woman fans? Yeah? Uh, I took Luna to see Wonder Woman. She'd seen the trailer, and she was like, ah, like another superhero movie. There's a lot of them. And I was like, yeah, I know. I think we should go see this one. And when we watched it, she cried in, like, the first five minutes. Like, not even to, like, one of the, like, big climactic parts. It was just, like, first opening scene. There's this young girl, and she's powerful, and she wants to be, like, brave. And, and Luna's just like, this is so empowering. Wonder Woman. Uh, but there are times in the narrative where she takes that off, she takes off the killer bangles and the tiara and she just becomes Diana Prince and she blends in. And I think there's times in our communities and in our schools and in our workplaces that we take off our super identity. We take off what God has declared about us and the power that we walk in and we just become normal and we fit in. For one reason or another, maybe it's we're afraid to stand out, or maybe we're nervous, or maybe we don't think our powers are that great, or maybe we're believing a lie that we don't even have those powers. For one reason or another, we choose to live out of an, uh, a secret identity, that, that alias, that, um, that natural identity. Um, one more example, T'Challa and Black Panther. T'Challa is like the, by day, I'm a prince of a fictional East African country. By nighttime, I put on a killer suit, and I've got awesome powers and killer biotech stuff, and it's really neat. Superheroes with secret identities. Okay, the second category, so superheroes with secret identities, it's who you are, but it's not really who you are. Like, you have this super power, you have this super identity, this righteousness that God has put inside of you. You have it, but that's not how you live most of your life. It's really just how you live some of your life. Like when a, a really bad situation comes up or a family member gets hurt or there's a car accident and, and someone texts you and is like, hey, you got to be praying. You put on that, that suit every once in a while, but that's not how you're living your life all the time. And I believe God has called us to live that life all the time. So superheroes with secret identities. The second category is superheroes with a known alias. So best example of this is like Tony Stark and Iron Man. When you see Tony Stark, you're like, oh, 
that's Iron Man. It's not a big secret. It's not like Clark Kent, where everyone's interacting with him and like, man, like, I had no idea who was Superman. Everyone who interacts with Tony Stark knows that he's Iron Man. And so this gets us a little bit closer to what God has called us to live. This gets it to where, like, you're now living in that super identity a little bit more often. You're putting on your suit as often as you can, even just to show up at, like, a kid's birthday party. You're putting on the suit to, like, show off how good your Heavenly Father is. You're doing something to show off all of the goodness that God and Jesus are birthing inside of you. You're beginning to walk in that identity a little bit more often, and it's no longer such a secret or no longer such a huge uh, contrast between who you are in the natural and who you are by what, like, God declares that you are. Um, Other examples, Steve Rogers in Captain America. You can see on here, he doesn't even wear a mask. Like, people just know, like, oh, that's Steve. He just has a shield now and calls himself Captain America. Like, it's, the line is beginning to blur between, like, one and the other. Um, Peter Quill and Star-Lord, he tells people, like, at one point he took off his mask, and he's like, no, star Anyways, if you've seen the movies, it's funny. If not, that's fine. (laughs) So you're living a little bit closer to your true identity. The third example is really what we're striving for. And like Paul said in Philippians 3, I have yet to achieve it. Yet, but I'm getting there. And we're all, I believe, working a little bit closer to getting to here. So superheroes with no alternate identity. These are superheroes who never stop being super. Superheroes that never, like, put on a mask or put on a cape or put on something and all of a sudden, like, they're transformed into who God declares them to be. They're just constantly living it. And the best example of this one is Thor. Any Thor fans in the room? Yeah? Okay. So Thor's really cool. Uh, If you follow the series, he's got a really big hammer Uh, and he can, like, do stuff with a hammer, which sounds, like, pretty ordinary, but it's a cool hammer. hammer. Even when he loses the hammer, he's still Thor, and he's still, like, really strong and does other, like, superhero things. And, And what's beautiful about him is even when he's locked up or even when he's chained up or even when he's bound or in bondage, can you make some analogical analogies? Can you make some connections there? Even when, he's, even when he's bound, he's still super. Like, he doesn't stop being Thor. He doesn't just become, like, Greg from accounting. Like, he is still, he is still a superhero. And, and I believe that's where God's calling us to live, is this place where he says, I declare you are righteous, which is something supernatural. Like, none of us in our own can achieve righteousness. We can't achieve right standing with God, where God now welcomes us in and says, you're perfect and holy. We can't achieve that on our own. So the fact that he calls us that is a superpower. He declares that we are righteous, and then we go out and we live it. And even on the days when it doesn't feel like it, even on the days when the good guys feel like they've lost, or even on the days when, when he's beat up and bound up, and, and all these things are going against him, he's still Thor. Like, he's still the superhero, and he never stops it. And I believe that's what God's calling us to. A couple of analogies, if you're Marvel fans. um, Groot and Rocket from Gardens of the Galaxy. They never stop being Groot and Rocket. Like, that's all the way who they are. They don't have, like, alternate driver's license that say something different. Uh, And Doctor Strange, uh, he was Stephen Strange. And then, like, he was a doctor. And then he just became Doctor Strange. And it's the same guy. He just, like, put on a cape, but, like... He never stopped being him. So anyways, living as God sees you. That's the big takeaway. That's the big point from that. When we live as God sees us, um, that's when we're walking in that true super identity. And so here's, here's a great verse that I want to share with you that uh, got me really excited about earlier this week. Colossians chapter 3. Flip, uh, or we'll put it up on the screen, but you can flip to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verse 1 through 10. It's a whole chunk of scripture, but I'm going to break it down for us real fast. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ. So this is, I'm no longer Peter Parker. i am now been raised to new life as Spider-Man. This is, I'm no longer Diana Prince. I've been raised to new life as Wonder Woman. Like Christ has now raised me to a new life. As we were watching baptisms earlier this morning, there was people being raised to new life. And it's a beautiful celebration. Like those people just got their superpower. And that's awesome. It continues, it says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. And this goes back to what I was thinking about, or what I was talking about at the beginning, when, um, when my thoughts are in conflict to God's thoughts. When my thoughts are in conflict to God's thoughts, it's because I'm not setting my sights on the realities of heaven. Instead, I'm setting my sights on the realities of earth. Two conflicting realities. 
I'm setting my sights on, I'm broke, I'm sick, I'm not righteous. I've messed up, I've made mistakes. When I'm setting my mind on those realities, that's of course how I'm going to live. But when I'm setting my mind on the realities of heaven, God is my provider, I have divine health, and I walk in righteousness, that is how I begin to live. And that's when I stop taking off my super suit, my super identity. That's when I stop putting on, you know, the hoodie and the jeans and, and take the school bus to school as Peter Parker. When I set my sight on the realities of heaven, that's when I've got my cape on, that's when I've got my superpowers, that's when I've got my Thor hammer, like that's when I am rocking it. And that's what God is calling us to. This verse continues, it says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Reiterating what I just said. It says, for you died to this life, and here's the part I love, and your real life, your real life, this isn't your real life, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's where our righteousness comes from. So the Lord's looking at us this morning and he's saying, hey, being Peter Parker, that's not your real life. Being Diana Prince or being T'Challa or being whatever the other examples I had, Tony Stark or Steve Rogers, Peter Quill, being all those normal people isn't your real life. Your real life is hidden in Christ in God. Our real life is our super, super identity. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Continuing in Colossians 3, it says, so put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Paul is exhorting this group, and he's telling them, he's like, you are righteous. Your real life is the righteousness of of God. Now, because of that, because that's your identity, this is how we need to live. Stop putting on the normal clothes continue to put on the super clothes, live that super identity. He gives them a whole list. He says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Our behavior is important, but our behavior does not dictate our identity. Our identity is should dictate our behavior. So because we are superheroes, we're going to start behaving like superheroes. Because we have superpowers, we're going to behave like we have superpowers. We're not going to take the bus. We're going to swing from rooftops. Like, that's what God has called us to. And so he says, because you're living this super identity, don't go back to, like, walking on the street. Soar with the eagles. Don't go back to just doing these things. Like, be super. He continues, he says, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of, and he goes into another list of things, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. He continues, he says, don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature. Think of it as like uh, Superman running into the phone booth, stripping off that old natural nature, that old sinful nature that old suit coat and glasses and just ripping the buttons off of those button-down shirts and all its wicked deeds and instead put on your new nature. Put on your Spidey suit, put on your Superman outfit, like put a big S on your chest and it says, and be renewed, be completely changed, a whole new creation as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That last verse is so beautiful. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So when we strip off the old sinful nature and we put on the new nature, and when we begin to fix our our sights and our mind on the realities of heaven, these two thoughts come to mind. Sin conscious or sun focused? Am Am I caught up in? Am I focused on? Am I constantly thinking about the ways that I've blown it and the sins and the mess and the mistakes that I have in my life? Or am I being renewed? Am I stripping off the old? Am I putting on the new? Am I fixing my eyes on the realities of Christ and the realities of heaven? And am I focusing on the Son? Am I focusing on the Father? Am I focusing on the power of the Holy Spirit to transform me from the inside out? How are we living? I want to leave you with with one other illustration. We talked about um, T'Challa and in the Black Panther series, Uh, The Black Panther character was originally a prince. His dad was a king of this country, Wakanda. And um, and in the story, uh, the dad passes away and the son becomes the new king and that's how he becomes the Black Panther. It's kind of neat. Anyways, 
I want us to just kind of rewind that story a little bit farther back, uh, create kind of our own origin story, if you will. Every superhero has got an origin story. And I want you to go back to when T'Challa, this prince, is, is maybe like eight years old. And I want you to imagine a time where he's a prince, he's living in this palace, and he's um, understanding like how much power his dad has. He's understanding his dad is the king and he can order people around. And so this prince, wanting to become like his dad, kind of gets a little power hungry and begins to, to order people around. So his room is messy and mom says, hey, you need to clean up his room. And so as he's walking to his room, he sees one of the people who serves around the palace and he says, you there, clean my room. And, and uh, the person's sort of like, uh, okay, like you are the prince, like I guess I should do this. If not else, like your dad will probably get mad if I just like flat out tell you no. And so there's a whole like power struggle there. He goes and he does this. And later on, the, the kid riding high and on this power sees someone in the kitchen. And he says, you there, make me a sandwich. And he's just, he's eight years old, but he is ordering everyone around. Well, word gets back to the king and uh, the king, the father, comes and finds his son and, and pulls him aside. And in that way, that delicately balances both the reverence, the respect, and the, um, and the fear that a king can instill, and also with the love and the tenderness that a father brings, he says, son. And I imagine it a lot like in The Lion King when Mufasa pulls like Simba, him and Nala just gotten into a bunch of trouble, and he's like, Simba! And, and Simba's like, oh, <laughs> like, dad, really? Like, I'm about to get it. I imagine a little bit like that. He says, T'Challa! And the, prince, the little prince comes, eight years old, getting into a bit of trouble, and Dad brings him over and he says, hey, son, that is not how a prince behaves. We don't just order people around. We don't just command them to do different things. We are honorable people and we treat others with honor. We are honorable people. We treat others with honor. That's who we are. That's what we do. This isn't how a prince behaves. This is how a prince behaves. In that moment, has the prince lost his princedom, his, his royalty? Has he lost his heir to the throne? Has he lost his inheritance or his position? No. But what he's beginning to understand is that his behavior doesn't dictate his identity. His behavior didn't cost him the throne in that moment. But instead, his, his identity is dictating his behavior. Because you are a prince, this is how princes behave. Because you are royalty, because you're representing a kingdom and a king, this is how you have to carry yourselves. You can imagine several other scenarios. Maybe he's, he's uh, 12 years old and he's blowing up. He's, he's at the restaurant and they're having a nice dinner and this wait staff is uh, reasonably nervous. They're waiting on royalty and one of them, shaking from the nervousness, drops a whole tray of, of drinks all over this young prince. He's 12 years old now and he completely loses it. He doesn't respond, he reacts. He has a knee-jerk reaction and he flies off the handle, says a lot of things that he should regret, but in his young, uh, youthful immaturity, he doesn't even know that he's supposed to regret him. He says all these awful things and then runs off to the restroom to grab some paper towels and start cleaning himself up. The king stands and with a reverence and with a, a solemnness, he apologizes for his son's actions and he goes to the bathroom to speak to him. And in that, in that restroom, I imagine there's an exchange. He says, son... That sort of same way, where it's a reverence of a king and the love of a father. He says, son, this is not how a prince behaves. We don't blow up at people. We don't react. Instead, we respond. And we respond with grace and with love and with truth. Because that's how a king does it. And that's how a prince does it. Again, not telling him, I can't believe you. I'm disowning you. you you've lost the throne. He doesn't ever do that. He just reminds him that because you're a prince, this is how you behave. Not because you behave this way. You must be a commoner. You must be uh, a miscreant. You must be a, a bum. Like, he doesn't ever say that. He says, because of who you are, this is how you should be behaving. This is how a prince behaves. And he sees the best in him and he calls it out. He says, you are righteous and he calls it out. I believe God's doing the same for us today. Maybe there's some things in our life that don't quite uh, measure up to God's beautiful standard for us. That's okay. It hasn't cost us the kingdom, hasn't cost us our position. It doesn't negate who we are. But God is saying, hey, as a prince, as a princess, this is how we should behave. This is who you really are. This is what I've really called you to be. And thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to live that way. 
He doesn't just tell us, hey, live holy and be holy as I'm holy. And then I hope you figure it out. You know, good luck. And just like, I hope you figure it. He doesn't do that. He sent the helper to help us every day, every moment, in every way. And we just have to partner with him and say, okay, God, help me to do this a little bit better. Help me to live the identity that you say I am. Help me not to have this conflicting thought that says, well, I must not be royalty. Well, I must not be a son or daughter of the king. Well, I must not be righteous. Help me instead to see that because I am righteous, now my behavior can come in line with that because that's who he declares that I am. Awesome. Um, Let me give you guys just a little bit of homework. Thank you. Let me give you just a little bit of homework. I took us through Colossians 3, 1 through 10, but I want you guys to look through 12 through 17. Uh, I mostly hit on the things where, he, where Paul's saying, don't do this and stop doing this and strip off this, put on the new life. But I stopped right there. What he actually continues into is, is the different things that make up the new life, the different things that you are empowered to, the different things that you have access to. And so what I want you to do this week is I want you to meditate on those scriptures. Feel free to go back verse 1 through 10, but I want you to focus on that 12 through 17 where you are learning what God has given you access to, what he's saying, these are the things that you can now put on as part of being a prince or being a son, being a daughter, being a princess. These are the things that you now have access to, to live to. And I want us to believe that and to put that on this week. Excellent. Um, I'm going to pray for you, uh, but as I do, our ministry teams are going to come forward and and they're going to be here. If you need prayer for this or anything else in your life and you want someone to stand in faith to partner with you in prayer, that's what our ministry team is here for. They never want to, uh, to make light or make little of whatever struggle is in your life. They're not here to shame or guilt or any of that. They're here to partner and to believe God's best for your life. So, um, so let me pray with you now. Father, we love you so much, and we are so thankful for your gift of the Holy Spirit, and we're thankful that you have declared us to be righteous. Father, we repent where we have actively worked against that declaration. We repent where we have partnered with the lies that have said that we aren't righteous, that we aren't good enough, that we're uh, pitiful, awful, and, and shameful. And Father, I thank you that you sent your son to rescue us from the islands of shame so that we could live in right relationship with you. I pray that this week you would empower us to fix our eyes on the realities of Christ, on the realities of heaven, and that we would clothe ourselves with righteousness, that we would put on our super identity, that we wouldn't try to walk in the natural, that we wouldn't reduce ourselves to just putting on a hoodie and jeans and taking the school bus to to school, but instead that we would swing from the rooftops, that we would live out our true life, which is hidden in Christ and God. Father, I pray that these words from the Bible would be transformative as they are living and active. I pray that they would come alive in our soul and we would be stirred up, motivated to change, that what we hear this morning and what we meditate on this afternoon would become life-changing this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.